In today's episode of the Path Monk Presents podcast, I have an interesting guest here with me today. I'm with Dan Vidig. He is hailing over as the growth and marketing, um, as the head of growth and commercial strategy, really, at OnRamp. And OnRamp is really looking at customer-centric onboarding. So obviously, you know, guys, we had a lot of folks on the show that, you know, are looking into product-led growth, right? A lot of marketers are talking about it at the moment. A lot of teams are moving that way. But then that's obviously the question, how do you onboard people? So we want to um, you know, learn from Dan's perspective, but also he's thinking about growth for on ramp. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Lucas. Very good. So give us that 360 overview. What is on ramp all about in your own words? Yeah. So at its core, uh, on ramp is a customer onboarding platform, uh, you know, where really particularly focused on the SaaS industry. So onboarding the customers of our SaaS customers. Um, because, you know, customer acquisition costs are high, uh, churn rates aren't as low as everyone wants them to be. And so profitability is based on renewals. And we have a hypothesis, a strongly held one that a great customer onboarding, a great first impression is the single most potent tool you can use to combat churn. Very good. Is there some, you know, how, how do you guys came across that lines? Is there some research that you've done? Because sometimes obviously onboarding and leaving can be weeks or months in between, you know, yeah. like maybe tell So more yeah, about that. there, there was a, a survey done in the last year or so. Uh, I believe it was done by Qualtrics that said the single most uh, commonly given reason for churn is a poor onboarding experience. But beyond that, kind of the, the origin story of OnRamp, if you will, our two founders were both customer success managers. Uh, and in fact, working, I, I won't say names, but working for a company that catered to commercial real estate. And now their sales team is closing high six-figure contracts. So, you know, real big numbers and a sales process to match. It was slick. It was easy to follow, very personalized. And then after signatures on the dotted line, a customer success manager would reach out and say, hey, thank you so much for buying from us. Please fill out this 14 tab spreadsheet and I'll be in touch soon. And it was just, it was this crazy dissonance between a, a personalized high touch sales process and uh, you know rather clunky, janky uh, onboarding process. And not because this was a company that didn't care, but because there weren't tools built specifically for onboarding. You know, if you, if you really wanted to go over the top, you could use a project management software maybe, but even that, it's not the proper fit. And so that's what led both of them to uh, leave their day jobs and create the first version of OnRamp. Gotcha. And, and so what types of companies are leveraging? Are we, are we thinking more like, you know, SaaS companies that have an automated onboarding flow? Are we talking, even you mentioned like, you know, real estate sort of scenarios, is it even service businesses that just you know, can slick in that process themselves as well. Yeah, so so sitting in the growth seat, you're always uh, tempted to be like, we serve everyone, but we don't, uh, or at least not today. Uh, where we've seen the most success is with SaaS organizations, though we've, we've garnered some interest from other professional service groups as well. But the key differentiator in who we serve best, in my opinion, is the type of onboarding. If onboarding to your organization means solely product training, there are some great tools on the market for pure product training. We shine most, we add the greatest value when you have a, a more complex, more involved onboarding process where there's work being done on both sides. You give your customer homework and then you do some work in response to their homework and there's a back and forth. Those tend to drag on the longest. They have the, the most landmines, if you will. Uh, and so that's where we add the most value. Very cool. Sounds like uh, more like higher ticket software products where there's involvement from, you know, if you're saying from both sides, it makes a whole lot of yeah, sense. Absolutely. Very good. Okay, cool. Um, so um, how or who within those companies, uh, you know, is reaching out to you? Is it a customer success manager? Is it a product manager that wants to sort of, you know, integrate onboarding into the product? Who, or is it even sales? Like who's reaching out to you guys? Yeah, so... We've had all of the above in some instances, uh, which isn't helpful, of course. Like getting one product manager to buy doesn't mean we're a product manager centric company. By and large, it is customer success professionals. So, you know, chief customer officer is a role you're seeing more commonly nowadays, which we're very happy about because it shows a, a customer centrism and a customer obsession similar to our own. Uh, but anywhere from the, the chief customer officer to the VP of customer success, down to, yeah, you know, I, I have many, many, many uh, conversations with 
frontline customer success managers, implementation specialists. Uh, no, not everyone uses the same names for, for these functions, uh, but the work is very similar across the board. Very cool. And, uh, you know, how do they hear about you guys? I mean, you are a very interesting product. For some, it's maybe a little bit of a new concept to even dig into. Like, how do they hear about you guys at the first place? In other words, what are the client acquisition channels you guys leverage? Yeah. Uh, so I love this question. And, and my bosses might get me a little, get a little mad at me for saying this, but you know, we play a little bigger and a little older than we are. We're a, we're a young, newer company in a young, newer industry vertical, you know, uh, we're not the only onboarding platform, but there are very few and they're all newer companies. And so for most of our history, our customer acquisition strategy was, was pure outbound sales. Um, and it, that's because we didn't have resources for exorbitant marketing budgets. We didn't have brand awareness, certainly didn't have brand loyalty uh, pre-customers. And so a lot of, lot of LinkedIn conversations, a lot of just talking to our industry without a sales pitch at first. Uh, which is incredibly important because when you're not selling, people will tell you what they want. Um, and that's, that's, you know, informed our product roadmap, informed our go-to-market strategy. Now, I, I did start by saying since our, our inception, that's been our, our plan. We're leaning more heavily into, into inbound, trying to drive those numbers up, uh, particularly by flexing our marketing muscles a bit more. We started all sales. We're now sales and marketing with marketing kind of growing we hope that marketing by, by the end of 22, that our marketing tactics are driving more, more lead gen, more demand gen than our outbound sales. Nothing wrong with outbound sales. You know, we, we, we love our, our outbound tactics, but, but we'd like to see that, that majority shift. Very cool. And you mentioned sort of that, you know, move towards inbound, like what, what role do you attribute into the website today and how do you see the role evolving over time? Yeah. So, you know, you're, your website's your, your shingle on the internet. It's, it's where anytime people hear your name, if they want to know about you, that's where they go. They don't you know, call you. They don't ask you to tell them. They, they go to your website. And you know, when I first joined the company, we, we had a pretty flat website. You know, it, was, it was high level, one or two pages, and we recently revamped it. Very happy with the work we did there. Uh, but you know, anyone who tells you that a website is, is done is probably not in marketing. Uh, your website's never done. You always improve it. You always try to grow it. You always add content. Um, and so we're happy with that. We've, we've recently been leaning more heavily into content marketing, uh, you know, primarily with blog posts today, but probably moving into video. Who knows, maybe a podcast in the future. Lucas, you could be our first guest. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the tactics where we're more investing in now. So nowadays. Cool. And I'm curious in that context, and it doesn't necessarily need to be just in the on-ramp context, because you've been sort of, you know, in um, interesting roles uh, across uh, quite some exciting companies, actually, over the, the last period. Um, what have you learned when it, you know, it comes to the website for a moment? Like, what, what have you learned? Like, what is, um, you know, how have you been looking at the website? Because you've been in various sort of like sales-driven business development roles. Now you're heading head of growth. Like, what was your take on the website? And um, what have you been learning does the website need to do for a sales team? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, someone should, in you know, 60 seconds of, of being on your website, know what your company does. Uh, and not only uh, like a longtime veteran industry insider, but you know, a, a random person off the street should be able to go to your website and see what it does. And in my instance, that, that test case was my father-in-law, who is not a, a you know, heavy technology user. Uh, you know, really more service oriented industry that he works in. And so the, our older iteration, he read it and said, yep, I don't get it. Our newer iteration, he read it and he sort of gets it. And that's, that's you know, the, the litmus test for me. Uh, yeah. Now, of course, when you ask someone within the industry or even adjacent to the industry, if you will, we're much better positioned now where people can look at our homepage, even just look at our hero on the homepage and say, oh, okay, I get the broad strokes. And if they click through two or three pages, maybe read a blog article, they'll really get what we do and they'll get what we're about. That's incredibly important. And so that's, it's simplistic admittedly, but that, that's my biggest driving force with the website. 
Yeah. Makes makes complete sense. I mean, we have a lot of people on the show. They build fantastic products, and exactly what you just said—that litmus test of just people not even getting the right concept or getting a wrong concept when they're on the website is um, it's actually more big probably than most people estimate um, of an issue. Very cool. Yeah. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. We talked about growth. We talked about the website. We talked about what you guys are doing. I'm curious to learn about your journey. Um, so th there's a lot of content actually out there, right? For for marketers and uh, also the role obviously of the sort of head of growth is something that is emerging you know as we speak and it's quite fast developing and um, how do you read where do you read what are the places you like to educate yourself for further with sort of you know when it comes to the head of growth function yeah so this may come across as perhaps lowbrow but i think the richest place to to find content to better yourself as a professional or even to just learn more about the profession of your customers is LinkedIn. There's, especially in the last two years, and you know we know life has changed in the last two years, uh, it's gotten more personal, more open. You know, People are really not just selling, not just promoting, not just marketing, but talking. Um, and that's been wild to, to see and wild to follow. And, and don't get me wrong, I do prospect on LinkedIn. We found many of our customers, if not most of them there. Uh, but that's probably where I've learned the most and not from, you know, ex sales training academy, but from, you know, Josh or Sally from, from other humans that have similar roles to mine. Uh, I think that's the best way to learn is to learn from others though. You know, I, I read the newsletters and, and pick up, you know, the, the big selling business books. I'd, I'd be remiss to say I don't, but, but that's all secondary to just other professionals like you and me. Awesome. I have some rapid fire questions to wrap it up for today. Are you ready for those? Hit me. What's the last book you read or the last podcast you listened to? The last book I read was uh, the, the Accelerated Growth Formula by HubSpot's most or HubSpot's first head of sales. Yeah, it's a classic. Um, what is one thing or thing that your company is focused on the most at the moment? So what are we focused on at the moment? Just, uh, do you mean product-wise, strategy-wise, or sort of open question? What's, what's the one thing that comes to mind? Yeah, so for me, it's our, our what I consider to be our key differentiator within the onboarding platform world. And that is we've created sort of a, a bifurcated experience where you know we have customers, but our customers have customers. Our job is to help our customers help their customers. It's you know, b 2 b to b and all sorts of inception jokes in there. But ultimately, we have a hypothesis uh, that we feel strongly about that customers should have, our customers' customers should have their own experience. And so we have what we call the customer portal and the internal site. Uh, internal being our customers, customers being our customers' customers. Uh, and it's a fully different user interface you know, to, to oversimplify, you could think of it as like admin versus user on a single-sided platform, uh, but with a lot more, you know, robust features associated with each, uh, including like white labeling. You know, when, when you get to the customer site, you don't see our brand colors. You see our customer's brand colors. You see our customer's logo in the corner. You know, we really believe we need to be successful. We need to be an extension of our customer's brand for their customers. If there would be no boundaries in technology, what's the one thing you would fix for your role today? Oh, that's a great one. Um, you know, to think of it slightly differently, what would I have done? So I'll answer what would I have done differently first as I continue to think about that better question. Uh, mm -hmm. I would have leaned into content marketing faster. I mm -hmm. saw an infographic on LinkedIn, I think it was yesterday, where it showed a logarithmic curve and an exponential curve. So, you know, big fat center versus, you know, skinnier center. And so this is the difference between the ROI on ad spend and content marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, ad spend, you feel it immediately. Like, oh, wow, I spent some money. I got some money. This is great. Let's spend some more money there. And it'll keep going up to a point where you reach diminishing returns. Content's the opposite. Your first post is going to do nothing. You'll get like five viewers, zero comments maybe a share from your mom or your you know, best friend from college. Uh, but if you keep at it, if you keep chopping that wood, keep posting valuable content, it's going to catch on. And the return on investment is going to be amazing. Like even you'll get 
you know, new, new meetings booked or new customers where when you ask what sealed the deal, what brought them in, it's a post you wrote six months ago, eight months ago. Uh, you know, content doesn't go stale unless you let it go stale. Uh, if you're relevant and, and the problems you're talking about are relevant to your customers, you know, that, that's going to work forever. Um, now, if, if tech had no boundaries, uh, I would probably try to improve the way we, we do demos today, not just at OnRamp, I mean for everyone. If you could find a way to harness AR and VR into the demo experience and make the customer, you know, feel like they're in the product. Uh, and I don't mean in like the metaverse way where you see the product around your walls, but just really experience it better. Uh, I think that would be cool. And that's apropos of nothing about OnRamp. That's just me being a nerd. Nice. Dan, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time with us today to be a guest on Path on Presents. I want to give you the very last word. If somebody would be forgetting all that we discussed about OnRamp, what's the one thing they should remember? So we sell to customer success teams. Customer success teams are high EQ, driven individuals whose, whose sole focus is making sure their customers are happy and supported well. So their bar for customer service and, and you know, high touch treatment is incredibly high. We meet and exceed that bar. We want to be better at customer success than our customers, which is very difficult to do. And that's what drives everything we do. Thanks a lot for being a guest on Pathfinder Presents. Thanks for having me.